and welcome back to the Dreamcast. I am your host, Denise Walsh. I combine science, scripture, and stories that will inspire you to dive deep, break through your own personal glass ceiling, and design a life of your dreams. Do you feel like you've not been able to make headway in achieving your goals? Or did you start the year pumped, ready to move forward on making things happen and simply lost your way? Things don't need to just get better. They actually can be better. In Design Your Dream Life, I'll show you a proven pathway to take you from where you are now to a life filled with joy, wholeness, success, and fulfillment. I'll give you the keys to not just developing a plan, but taking massive empowered action to make your dreams a reality. Turn roadblocks into stepping stones and leverage the power of gratitude and forgiveness. Let's face it, taking massive empowered action and making your dreams a reality isn't always easy. So I'll be there with you every step of the way. Visit dreamlifetoolkit.com to purchase your copy of Design Your Dream Life, obtain resources and join our free community. Again, that's dreamlifetoolkit.com. Big, big welcome back to the Dreamcast. Our next guest founded her company, Ariel, at the age of 21 with a mission to elevate people and places. Since then, she's formed multiple companies under the Ariel brand, all with the same mission of empowering people, sustaining the planet, and utilizing capitalism as a force for good. Through the success of her companies over the past 10 years, she is resetting the standard for what is possible for women and young people around the globe and has even won several national and international awards for speed of growth, innovation, and trajectory. Ariel's commitment to a triple bottom line approach is proving that conscious business is not only viable, but the way of the future. I love talking to people who know what they want are excited about it, and then go stinking do it. So big Dreamcast welcome to Brittany Turner. Hello, thank you for having me. Yay, I'm glad to talk with you. I apologize in advance for my cold that came on last night. I'm excited to hear more about what your business is and what you do. So can you first tell me us a little bit about what is Ariel? Ariel is a brand uh, that is dedicated to elevating people and places. And every company that we start underneath that brand is doing that in its own way. My vision is to develop nations because I went on a bunch of mission trips and I got really frustrated at the thought of, you know, I thought I wanted to be a missionary, but then once I went on these mission trips and realized I wasn't solving the issue at its root, I've been on a mission to figure out how to do that. And so a glance, you'd think we just have several successful businesses, but the underlying dream and every day what we're working towards isn't just making money and doing cool stuff. It's actually how do you learn what it takes to solve the most horrible atrocities known to man at its root and to where they're not an issue anymore. And so one of my larger companies is Aerial Development Group. And we take the most hopeless places and make them economically self-sustainable. And we get people to believe in these places again to invest in them to bring them back to life or make it safe for people to use the park or make it safe for people to be out walking in their neighborhoods and get to know each other. And so that's just the very top. We also, the developments that we own, every single one of them, we pick a different social issue and we say, or as many as we can, and say, how can we address this? Honestly, because we control the property, you get to kind of say what happens. And so good people need to be in charge of the resources in this world. And so I like to challenge people who think that it's holy to have nothing and just run around and like help people. Yeah, cool. But if all money does is expand everything that you touch and everything that it touches. So if the good people have the money, the resources, the network, you can really go at things uh, with a plan. And so every single company from the media production company to the development group to our multifamily company to what we're doing overseas is attacking different things, but setting us up to where we can work in developing nations when they need it most, specifically focused right after a disaster. Okay, awesome. So is, are your developments primarily in the States right now or are they overseas? We've got both, but primarily in the States. 
Cool. Now I grew up going on mission trips as well. And most of our mission trips were in the States in Tennessee and Kentucky. And we did home repair and all of that kind of stuff. But then I've also been to Africa and Swaziland and did some mission trips over there. And I, I can, I totally understand the idea that when you have the bug to serve and to give back in this way, like it really can, it's your passion. So how did you take that passion of service and really say like, what was the turning point where you said, I need to do something more than just come once a year? How do you turn it into a business? Well, I mean, it wasn't, I didn't even know I'd go into business. So I love to encourage people who are in business. I'm like, well, you had not figured out more than I did. I thought I was just going to flip some houses and then move to Africa. And so then it turned into a business as I learned, God, and you know, God is just so good. You know, he sneak attacks you and convinces you to do stuff you'd never think you should do or would do. And mine was, all right, well, I'll just flip some houses, then I'll move. And then after I had done that for a couple of years, and I was irritated because I'm a baby. I'm like, I just want to, I just want to save babies right now. I don't want to have to do this business thing. And I don't know, it was in my brain. It was like super boring. And so the first time I went back after being in business for like three, four years, I went to this village in uh, Kenya and we were working on developing an orphanage and I was hiking the land and I realized, oh my gosh, I can help them do this land deal. And then as we were continuing to walk it, we were laying it out. I realized that I had the skill set of doing a site plan and saying where things should go to optimize the development of this orphanage to where it's not just shoving kids into a warehouse. You can actually recreate a family model. And then how do you lay out the cow farm, chicken farm, vegetable garden, or how do you do the market study to do, you know, are you doing chickens or tilapia? What's going to not flood the market to where you can actually not only train the kids, give them healthy food, but also create an income and cash flow for the orphanage to cover the overhead so you're not having to beg people for money every month. I freaking hate, hate asking for money. Oh, oh. And that's the best part about business to all of you who are really passionate about doing something is you get to tell everybody you want to just suck it. I make my own freaking money and you don't have to fund my vision. It's nice when you can go in with people. That's really harsh, but it's nice when you can go in with people, but it's better when you don't have to basically count on anybody to live your purpose in life. You know, yeah. you count on your team. Of course you count on everybody you work with, but I don't have to go beg some dude on a yacht for the money to build this orphanage. I have a way to be able to pull that off on my own. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Well, it's, it's, it's awesome because you see a need and you can go fill it. You don't have to be a bridge. You don't have to go, you know, market the need and get people to donate. You really have created a way where you can earn it and, and go fill the need yourself, which gives you and your team just that much more influence. So did you know anybody that did this? Did you no, find people that did this? How did you learn the skills to, to grow in this way? Well, to finish that other thought, the, the cool part was that what I thought was just working to make money, I had actually been learning the skills to make a real change in the area that I wanted. And so it was so cool that God had like made me go into real estate where I learned the skills to make sustainable change, not just love on kids. Of course, I'm going to love on kids. But how can you really set things up for generations to be affected and to make something sustainable to where at any point these kids aren't going to go hungry because they lost their income source, you know, or they're going back into these abusive situations. So, so that was really cool because whatever you learn in business, find a way to constantly ask yourself, how can I apply this to my greater passion? Because a lot of people are, are hating their jobs. And I'm like, don't curse the gift. The gift that you have is, is the way maker for you to live this other thing. And, and life isn't Instagram, these, these series of highlights. Life is basically a lot of hard freaking work for incredible moments where everything comes together because you put in the time. You put in the energy and, and you learn those skills, but it's not easy. And I think that based on where just we are with, in society, because of those Instagram moments, people think that that should be all day, every day, and they end up being really depressed. For me, one of, some of the best advice I can give is make sure everything is pointing you in that right direction. 
even if it looks like an opportunity, it could be a distraction if it's not going to eventually give you the transferable skills or the network to get you where you really want to go. And so I've been able to make decisions even when I was freaking homeless to stay on track because I was working for free for some guys. This is to answer your second question that would teach me the skill set of rehabbing. And so I was rehabbing houses. I was working for free because I had the long-term vision of I'll learn this skill versus taking the waitressing job that would pay my bills and give me that quick cash. I had to learn. And so, and I, I didn't have kids or anything like that. So I was able to make that sacrifice. But after nine months of doing that, I became the biggest rehabber in Nashville. You know, it was, it was awesome. Um, because I learned how to work to learn, not necessarily work to earn. Perfect. Beautiful. And I think you, because you have the long-term vision of where you are going, you might not know the steps every, every day. You don't know the how necessarily. And it's really cool to look back and see how the pieces fit together, how this skill wasn't just a way to make money so you could go back and live your passion, but it really gave you the skills to do your passion even more. So were there times throughout this journey that you felt like giving up or you wondered like, oh my gosh, is this worth it? Were there times that I didn't feel like giving up and asking myself that? I asked myself that this morning. I mean, it's, it, it is, this is really hard. Um, but I'm really genius at the way that I keep myself awake and aware. I mean, even these like posters behind me, all, all the decoration in my office space and in my house and in my car is always reminding me of the bigger picture. The name Ariel is a constant reminder of the bigger picture. And so uh, that's the biggest thing is to like when you are stressed and when things suck and when people let you down, when people stab you in the back, when you get sued, da, 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 da. what has this always been about? And so I definitely recommend people start with their why. If not, you will get knocked out of a game. If you try to do something that's never been done before, or if you try to do something that's really hard, a lot of people won't believe in you if you try to do something that's never been done before or really hard. And they say it in a voice of love because they're trying to protect you. But when you know your why, then you can hear past people's doubt and you can hear past your own fear. And you can hear past your own insecurities, which I deal with every single day. Literally just got off a two hour long coaching call. It's supposed to be 30 minutes. This poor guy. I'm like, help me solve this problem. <laughs> I was so anxious the last couple of days. And I'm like, so you have to create your own systems on how do you deal with your own anxiety, insecurity, fear, and when people stab you in the back. And so for me, it took me like four years to figure this out, but I found a way to create my own little bubble of joy because and I'm an empath and everything. I feel freaking everything. So it's really hard to do this. How do you not let your external circumstances or your hope in humans when they lay down so much? Like, how do you make sure that doesn't destroy your peace and your joy? And so I'll give you a quick tip on anxiety, especially. Uh, anxiety is a fear in the future. Anxiety is worry about things you can't of, you know, what is going to happen. And, and you're trying to protect yourself. It's a normal human survival instinct. And so the way that you can overcome that is to, again, be completely present, focus on right now, and then look back and think, I haven't died so far. <laughs> okay. <laughs> God hasn't let me down so far. And to date, I've chosen to use every obstacle that's ever come my way for good. And it has always worked out. So why would I need to fear now. And, and then I ask myself, does this emotion serve the greater purpose? And does, is this useful for getting me to where I need to be to no longer feel this anymore? Um, most people just choose to numb it via alcohol or Instagram or running to boys or whatever, whatever they want to run to. Everything you're running to is everything you have to give up in order to exist at that next level. And so when you feel those anxieties or fears or whatever it is, don't focus on that. Say, why am I feeling this? What do I need to do to no longer feel this by solving it? And then to date, God hasn't let me down so far. So I shouldn't give in to this emotion anymore. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think the the bubble that you speak of is so important because if we don't have that and we don't create a system, then we either are Uber up like roller coaster ourselves because we're, you know, we're reacting to everything that is going on around us or we like get burnout. And I mean, I was a clinical psychologist before I started my entrepreneurial venture and I, you know, you like end up hating people <laughs> and you end up not wanting to so work with them anymore. Everybody. <laughs> so we used to joke, we'd be like, can my next job be in a greenhouse, please? <laughs> like only work with plants. So you have to keep that bubble so you can keep your love and your joy up. So you can keep passionate, stay passionate about your work. So what are some tips you, you do to keep your joy up and keep your, you know, your bubble kind of protecting you? It's always about remembering. You know, because I think we fall asleep to what matters and we fall asleep to what has happened already and you forget your own strength and greatness. So you just have to remember a couple things. I mean, for me, I I always tell everybody, start with your eulogy, write your eulogy, figure out what matters to you because all the stupid crap doesn't matter. And so when you're thinking about the end of your life, it's not like a suicidal kind of weird thing. It's end of your life. Only for sure thing in your life is that you're going to die. What did I spend my time on? How did people know who I was? And then you remember that champions are made in horrible moments. <laughs> so, so every time I'm dealing with a bunch of crap, I'm like, hmm, if they were going to tell a story about me being the general of this army, <laughs> how did she react when everything hit the freaking fan? And I'm not proud of all my moments, but it's definitely a, a daily choice. So for me, I wrote my eulogy and then I wrote those statements down and then I found pictures of what I need to spend my time on and what I need to think about so that I don't give in to the temporary temptations of running to whatever numbs me. You know, it's it's normally you're feeling those things because you're about to break through something. So how do you find the energy to push through it? And it's so freaking hard. Oh my gosh. But uh, that's, that's something that I do. And then I'm really intentional. I audit my days. Again, I, I read mine every day and I look at my little vision board and I ask myself, is what I'm spending my time on today, what, I, what I've got on my calendar, taking me closer to those statements or is it a distraction? And something that's really easy to do, especially I think for women, probably everybody, but I'm a woman, so I don't know what you guys are thinking, is to spend time on other people's stuff kind of like it's way more fun to clean somebody else's closet than your own. And so the only way the world will ever treat us like we're worth anything, women out there, is to be willing to share what we've done. Because we've done some awesome stuff, but we will hide it. It's not like you're bragging. Just freaking share it to encourage others. I mean, I remember this one time. I, it was the first time my like story had gone out there. And I had like this crazy amount of haters. I just come out of the woodwork and just hate on me. It was horrible. I'd never had haters before. I was like, oh my gosh. I was like 22 or 23. And I was like, I'm never telling my story again. Like never. And I was like, I'm just going to be that millionaire next door with the secret life. And nobody's going to know anything. But I had just given a speech. So my like story went out there and then I'd just given a speech and then I decided I'm never telling anybody anything again. I'm not speaking. I'm not doing any of this crap. And this girl came up to me at the grocery store and she's like, oh my gosh, are you Brittany Turner? And I was like, crap, I'm a hater. It's going to be a hater. I was like, yes. She said, I actually heard you speak last week. I was like, okay. She said, and I broke up with my boyfriend. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm sorry. She said, after hearing your story, I realized that I can do more with my life. He has beat the out of me for five years. And I never thought I was worth anything more or that I could do anything more based on what he told me. And I believed him because I thought he loved me. And after just hearing what you've accomplished in like flipping houses, like this has no correlation to an abusive boyfriend at the time. And she's like, I realized that I could do more. And so I just want to encourage you women, one, to help each other before each other like there's no like we don't have time to be jealous or stupid like we got a lot to do we got people to help and you need to work together to get that done um but also share your story you will have haters you can have weirdos i put like two guys in jail and like just people are weird but it's worth it because you never know who you will encourage to see what they're capable of in their one chance on earth and what lies they've been believing that are holding them in a cage against their potential. 
And so, you know, I believe that, that women are finding their value and they're finally able to overcome their own insecurity and the lies that have been spoken over them. But that is nothing that's, it's not a war against men. It's just simply the other 50% of God's children walking in everything that they're supposed to walk in. And so I've been a part of some women groups that just get really angry and hate men because they've been through a lot of crap. But you know what? The more they see that we're capable of, the less they'll talk to us like we can't do it because it will be normalized. So let's just normalize it by sharing. Absolutely. I love that. And, and women are finding their voice. They're finding their, that what they want is important, that who they are is important, that they have something to contribute and something to say in the world. And you mentioned that Ariel it reminds you of the bigger vision for you. What is, what is, why did you name your company that? What does that mean to you? I actually feel like God gave me the name like two years before I even started my business. And I went home and Googled it because I saw a very specific spelling and it, it had two answers. One was existing and creating above the rest. And that really speaks of excellence and having a higher standard. It's very easy, especially in the beginning to cut corners. But I'm telling you, don't cut corners. Don't just take the money option. Um, think long term about your brand and your values. And, and what's crazy is how it comes back to you. It could be five years later. Think long term. Uh, so existing and creating above the rest, and then it was um, keeping the big picture. And think about the aerial views from up high. You can see the whole plan, and so you don't get lost in today or the issue of today. So I have like, I look like a total nerd. I've got literally space stuff everywhere. I've got space books all over. All my like decorations are space, or literally maps of aerial views, and it's. It's just to remember the big picture. And when you look at space, you realize how tiny we are and how infinite God is and how much bigger he is and how he's already thought of this stuff and dealt with it. And so you can overcome this thing that you might not feel like you can overcome. And so that's why I decorate with space. I love it. I love it. You're so right. Because when we, anytime we go down the rabbit trail of anxiety or fear or that monkey mind or stinking thinking or all that, you know, the stuff that keeps us stuck. It's because we're so often, at least I find for me, I'm like so worried about when you take a step back and look at the big picture, you realize it doesn't matter. I like to say, if it doesn't matter in five years, it shouldn't matter now. Exactly. And I think I've myself found myself thinking and worrying and stressing over things that at the end of the day, worth my time and energy. Now, one thing you've talked about a lot in before we even pressed record was taking care of your health throughout this CEO entrepreneurial journey. Because when you're an entrepreneur, you don't necessarily clock in and clock out. You have endless to-do lists and, and you're the, in the driver's seat of all of the businesses. So you, it's very easy to run yourself ragged and, and work nonstop, especially when you're passionate about it. So what have you done to keep yourself well-rounded and sane, I guess? <laughs> I uh, thank God I'm killed over by now, but uh, the best advice I can give people who are just getting started and who have been in it forever really is to take care of the vessel that you're stuck in, your body. You can't really change this and it doesn't matter that you're going to be uber successful or that you're helping a lot of people if you die at 40. So let's, let's take care of this crap. You know, I did not think about that. It sounds so stupid, but I didn't grow up eating healthy. Um, I always lifted weights because I love muscles, um, but I, I didn't understand the importance of mind clarity or being able to really get these downloads that I get now because I am in a space that my health, I'm not just like barely making it. You know, I, I started out working 18 to 21 hours a day for seven years and a long, <laughs> a long story about how I ended up not having to do that anymore, but the kind of leader that I can be and show up as if I'm not putting stupid stuff in my body. Like if you're eating junk, why do you think your body's going to give you good ideas? Like you're not. So also people, man looks at the outside, God looks at the heart. Doesn't mean we all need to be supermodels or anything like that. But if they look at you and you are physically a mess or you're like gaining tons of weight because you're putting your business first, People won't invest in you because they're like, well, if they can't take care of themselves, it's a subliminal thing. They don't even know. Then why would I think they're going to take care of my money? Or why would I think I can trust them with this project? Or whatever it is. Um, prioritize your health. Literally, there is no point in having any money or any of this 
the stuff that your business will give you if you're not feeling well enough to enjoy it. Does that make sense? And so bottom line, super basics is you got to figure out what works for you. But it's so easy to Google right now. And just the junk that you're putting in or the fast grabs can kill you. And so for me, I run five companies and a nonprofit. Uh, I'm global. I have a billion houses. Like <laughs> I've got so much stuff going on. I have real problems. I'm always in, you know, it's, it's just, it's crazy the stuff that I do. And I decided, how can I prioritize my health and not drop the ball on any of my company? So I decided to do a bodybuilding competition last May. And I was like, I don't have time to cook. Never, never going to cook. Sorry. Sorry. Whoever man I end up with out there, never going to cook. I just, I don't, I can't. Um, <laughs> I have no desire. I'm not going to cook. I'm not going to drop the ball on my businesses. And I'm going to look like a pro athlete. So how can I do this? And I actually figured it out. And so I found a meal prep company that would make me healthy, organic stuff. Also, I'm pescatarian. So I've got like all these limits. And I'm not going to stop traveling. So I figured it out. The way that I figure everything out is I find somebody who looks the part um, and is doing what I want to do. And so I, I got myself a good coach. I got myself, I probably had like four coaches. It was ridiculous. Teaching me the mindset, teaching me all the rules of thumb on how to, to look that way. But then I also wanted to do it healthy and then like a trainer. So it was cool. I had a meal prep company. I turned my meetings instead of like sitting here in this office on my butt. I had walking meetings and I would literally, I'm like, you want to meet with me and pick my brain? Fine. We're doing it on the treadmill. Bring your notebook. You can stand if you want to, but I'm talking while I'm walking. Traveling, there's like this cooler that you can put your meal prep stuff in. I have my vitamins in my desk next door. I have, I have a whole series of ooh, weights in every room of my office. Like it doesn't matter what room I'm in and we're in a room and it's taking too long. I just start lifting. And, and so, and then the accountability, I had to text my trainer every time that I ate and I had to text them that I did the workouts. And so, because if you're not, if there's fires burning. My business is my priority. I'm not going to drop the ball on that. But if you're not yelling at me as my coach <laughs> and you're not becoming a fire too. So I told them like, here's how I'm going to get out of me. Here's how I'm going to totally not do anything that you say. Know that those are very good sales tactics. So I need you to uh, not let me get away with that. So, so knowing your weaknesses, it was great. I got second place. So now I have to do one and win, which is so frustrating. But it's fine. I enjoyed it. it. And I felt better than I've felt my entire life. I was more confident. It was crazy how much people respected me because my body was in balance and my mind was in balance. So it was super fun and I highly recommend it. But at the minimum, find a way to get healthy food into your life. Meal prep companies are everywhere. They're cheaper than buying your own food. Honestly, they deliver to your office. Find a way, not an excuse. Yeah, absolutely. My son is um, in second grade and in his school, there's a sign that says, I can do hard things. And I find when you do hard things, you realize what you're truly capable of, you know, and what you, when you get to the other side and you make it and you're a finisher and like you realize, oh my gosh, I truly can do anything. What? It was awesome. It does. It, you, you grow so much inside. Just like you said, the struggle is often what you talk about on stage, right? <laughs> and so when we, when we choose and we, we do the hard thing instead of the easy thing, that's when we kind of grow those, those muscles. So what is your favorite project that you're working on right now? Ooh, some of them I can't talk about, but the ones I can talk about, uh, I've got a health and wellness development in Nashville. It's the first health and wellness community and when we were designing it in the beginning, I know what I was doing. I never do. And, but, but I find people who do, and I'm willing to ask them the questions. I'm willing to look stupid. I'm like, I don't understand what you're saying. I'll just ask you. But I also find a way to create value. So instead of just, I'll take you to lunch and ask you to share millions of dollars of wisdom, it's like, I'll make people partners on deals. And as a person that is a partner, literally your obligation is to meet with me for lunch once a week until the project's done. And let me ask you whatever I want. I save all those questions and I take notes. And people love partnering with me because I create value and I make it easy for them. I do all the work and I'm not entitled. So my favorite project is, is that one. It's so freaking cute. I did what a lot of people told me not to do, which was make them cute, care about the community, care about the surrounding community. And when we Googled 
this was literally us. We had 10 acres of land. We're like, all right, it's the first time we've had this much land. What can we do when you can control an environment like that? And so <laughs> we Googled top issues in Tennessee. And number one was we were, we were number four in the nation at the time for highest rating of obesity related diseases. And I'm like, all right, if developers can design something that everybody has to live in, then how can we solve people dying from obesity related diseases by making it not normal to eat crap and never go outside and not exercise. So we designed the whole 62 house development and the restaurant around getting out, getting active. We were really blessed to back up to a greenway. We paid to put the greenway connection in. And so now not only our neighborhood, but the entire surrounding neighborhood has access to 960 acres of park. Their kids can play in the front yard. They get out and exercise. The way we did the windows, the way we did the colors, the way we did the stairs, everything actually gets to your subconscious and tells you to go out and be active, which is so cool. And, uh, and people say things to us that they're like, I didn't even realize how inactive I was until I had access. Because just like I said, you have to have weights and healthy food around you that you can grab to give you access. Health, what I have found for me is that it's about access. And so we give buyers a bike when they buy a house. We're like, you're going to use this. <laughs> you know, so, so it's one of those things like, well, I have a bike. Now I should use it. And so we take away as many excuses as we can uh, to encourage people to, to live a better life. And so anyway, it's been really fun. We've got urban gardens in there. The restaurant is all health. And so people are really busy. They've got meal prep too. And it's like, they've got vegan options. It's like, it's just really cool because you're picking, you stick to your values. Yeah. But everybody told me not to do it because we're like, oh, it's a stupid waste of money. Why would you put an outdoor gym out there? I'm like, trust me. And they sell faster and for more money than anybody else. Which yeah. Is awesome. yeah, because you're creating a place where people want to live. What I love about what you did is number one, you asked questions. You didn't just start doing, you really surveyed the need, but then you took that need and said long-term view. You didn't just do a quick fix. It was like, no, like, not just the first round of families that live here, but the second round and what's the atmosphere. And, and so that long-term view, that aerial view is, was from the beginning, middle and end of the project. How fun. Okay. Two more questions. One is about your missions. What has been a really fun project that you've been able to do in developing nations that you are the most excited about? Mm, we, so the British Virgin Islands, uh, I fell in that I fell in love with that in 2014 and before the hurricanes that actually spent a lot of time there and made a lot of friends. And the day of the hurricanes in 2017, Hurricane Irma had just hit it. All communication was lost. We, I couldn't talk to any of my friends. I didn't know if they were dead or alive. It looked like everybody was dead. Honestly, there's 20,000 people that lived there and the British military took 5,000 body bags because they thought everyone was gone. I mean, it was really rough. So I ended up taking a team down there and snuck in the country with our backpacks on and our boots on. And we, we thought, again, we'd have to sleep in tents and just go look for my friend's bodies. We were one of the first responders. I had no idea what I was doing, by the way. I mean, I just cared and I wanted to find a way to help. So when we went down there, I found that uh, Richard Branson was using his Necker Bell, one of the most awesome catamarans in the world, as a rescue boat. And uh, before, you know, the other island owners were using their helicopters to deliver food to remote islands. And um, Kurt Richardson, uh, he owns an island down there too. He paid for Convoy of Hope to feed the whole country for like 120 days. This cruise ship. I was like, oh my gosh, these, these entrepreneurs are so freaking bomb. They are doing things. They have the resources to help people in their greatest hour of need. And, and I looked at my life and was like, I was a little ashamed because I'd been dealing with some burnout. I'm like, does it really matter? Like, do you really want to do this? And, and I felt convicted. Brittany, yes, I came from nothing. But like, you have learned by studying and by being around things how to do great things and have great resources. And you've been avoiding it because you were tired or you didn't get to do what everybody gets to do. And it's like, I didn't at that moment have the resources to be able to do the kinds of things that I knew I could do. So the one thing I was convicted of two, I did audit my life and say, what can I do now 
as I now have a new energy for my businesses to go after everything that God has for me. And one of my businesses is Ariel Produced. And so we said, if tourism is their number one economic pillar, and they just got smited, uh, everybody's going to cancel their trips here. And they may never recover because the brand is now that they're devastated. And so we said, how can we retell the story and create hope, have people come back, but also have people continue to vacation in and invest in the BBI. And so again, didn't know what we were doing, but just thought about it, thought about the issues and then figured out day by day the outline. And so we created the web series BBI Stronger on YouTube. I recommend everybody watch it. It's so good. And it did everything that we wanted it to do. On top of, it ended up being a way to template. I'm very good at templating. Why? Because I lived in my freaking car and you can't make the same mistake twice. <laughs> so I was like, <laughs> uh, not naturally a very organized person, but when you can't eat, if you keep making mistakes, you learn to be really organized. So don't label yourself and, and hurt your own calling. So we templated what, was, what did the BBI do right? What could they have done better? And if somebody else was to be hit by a category, the strongest category five to ever hit the Atlantic and just quote unquote devastate their country, what can, how can they recover 10 times faster based on what they saw in this series? You don't know what to do in those moments because you've never been through them. So we shared like, what does leadership look like after a storm? What do people need to bring with them? How do you prepare for a storm? How can the outside world get involved? And so it's been really fun to document their journey of recovery and then be able to help other people in the future or other countries in the future recover faster. So that's my favorite freaking project in developing nations is media is the most powerful tool in the world. And nobody is taking the time to tell the good stories because that's not what sells quickly. And so with that long-term view, we're taking the time to, to share the right story and encourage the people along the way. It's we, oh, so fun. I'm like, everybody knows this down there now. And they like come up and hug me. And like, I've had so many people cry and thank me for making a YouTube series because they said, I lost all hope and I wanted to kill myself. But I watched episode two and I saw how far we've come. And because I've seen where we came from and where we are now, I had the hope to continue to tomorrow. So thank you for saving my life. I'm like, oh. <laughs> so I get stuff like that all the time. It's, um, but you know, we didn't know what we were doing. And I encourage you just like, don't think you have to have it figured out. Do ask questions, but start just doing what you do know to do. Again, God's never going to give you the full picture, but as you're moving, you'll keep learning if you're aware and you're not getting lost in your own fears. I was going to say, because you weren't a videographer, you were a real estate person. So you had to go find the people who knew what to do and cast that vision and just create the space. And that's beautiful. Beautiful. Well, definitely. You have a media production company, but we had never done something like that. Yeah. And they're literally every person working there is under 25 and a woman and had never done something like this before in a really chaotic, dangerous environment, but they're willing to figure it out. And that's my greatest advice is to figure it out. And you we'll, will. We'll put that YouTube series in the show notes below you guys. So you can totally check it out. Before I have asked my last question, how long were you living in a car? Nine months. Nine months. Okay. Okay. And then um, this was because of a business mistake or... Just no, like I moved to Nashville to learn the business. I was going to work for this big speaker on it. He sold courses and stuff like that. I had bought a house at 18. I rented it out to these guys on Craigslist. And I took a job that was $600 less than the minimums on my credit cards because I had lived off my credit cards for like a year before that trying to learn this business. So I was like, all right, well, the only way to learn is going to be able to work for somebody who's doing it. So I moved to Nashville, never been there before, had no network, um, 21 years old. And my family's like, stupid, getting into real estate right now is bad, but I don't watch TV. So I didn't know about the global economic crisis we were going through. And so I'm like, no, it's going to work. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build orphanages. So I move up there and I'm so determined. I don't listen to anybody. And then I get fired within 60 days of working for those guys. Like, yeah, we don't need this position anymore. I'm like, ah. So the first month's rent check from the guys who were renting my house in Charlotte bounced. So I've got this mortgage payment no income. I can't tell my family that I'm now a loser with no job. 
because I didn't go to college. I'm like, college doesn't teach what I want to learn. Why would I go? So anyway, everything sucked. But the day I got fired, I found these two guys that were rehabbers. And I was like, again, everything in you is like, will you pay me $10,000 a month to cover my bills? No. But I said, even though I was in that horrible situation, I was like, can I work for you for free? I just want to learn. And um, yeah, I, I had to move into my car and I worked for them. They wouldn't tell me even what to do. I had to like find a way to create value for them to keep me around. So I'd literally sit in their car and meet them at like six in the morning. I'd sit in their car and I'd listen to their phone conversations, hear where they're frustrated, take notes, and then try to make them not frustrated. That was my plan. And in return, I ended up learning the business. I learned how to find deals because again, they were short on finding enough deals. I learned how to find investors. They needed more investor money. I learned how to find project manager or subcontractors, how to design the houses, how to sell them. Every single one of them is just something that they were irritated about. And that's the best advice I can give you is find someone who is in the business that you want to be in, that you want to learn from, instead of asking them to freaking coffee again. I get a million requests for that. Sorry, guys. Instead of asking them to coffee, literally say, what are you most frustrated at in life right now? And can I help you solve that issue? They're going to keep you around if you create value in their life. So that's the best advice I have on finding a mentor. God works in mysterious ways because I'm sure you would not have you know, move to Nashville right. to work for free to, oh, right. I mean, you know, he, had, he had to get you there somehow. And it's amazing when you're on the other side of that hardship to look back and see how it lines up. So in the midst of that hardship, remembering to trust and keep that aerial view is super powerful. Gotta let you go yeah. through a series of sucky times so that you have a cool story. And sometimes you gotta remember, the story isn't for you. It's to encourage other people that, even though it looks like you're a total failure, you're trying to start a real estate rehabbing business in 2007 through 2009. <laughs> like the worst time you can get in with no education as a woman in the South with no network and no nothing. Like you look like an idiot, but, but God's going to work it out, you know? And, and the hardest thing is to overcome that public shame. And, but just think about Noah. I think about him all the time. I'm like, oh my gosh, he probably felt like an idiot working for 120 years or whatever, and it had never rained before. <laughs> like, Think about that crazy guy Noah was, and then in the end, he stuck to what God showed him to do, and he was right and lived. So you've got to thank, thank God for the people who have bigger faith than, uh, than worrying about what everybody says about them. I love that. I love that. Well, thank you so, so much for your time and your wisdom today. You are certainly somebody that we want to be around because as you've done, you're adding value everywhere that you go, uh, not just for today, but for the long term. So my last question is simply, is there something that you do every day that you couldn't live without? Mm, yeah, every day. Yeah, I do. I, I kind of touched on it earlier. Every day when I'm getting ready, I do like five things. I I read my eulogy and I remember what I'm going for because, again, I find the energy to focus. I look at my vision board and I pray and I, I ask the Lord to bring in the right people and to help me focus on what matters versus escaping into momentary pleasures. And then I listen to audiobooks. I listen to, uh, instead of listening to music, I'd say I'm, I'd say I'm about 70-30 right now, 70% audiobooks. 30% is just because other people are around me and they wouldn't understand based on where I am in the book. So I never have time to read a book, um, but I have lots of time to, I don't have lots of time to do anything, but I'm in the car or I'm getting ready or I'm, instead of drowning myself out in some Netflix dumb series, I'm just putting in my brain what I want to become. And so audiobooks is probably my best trick for keeping your mind stable enough to do all this. Awesome. Awesome. I love it. I love it. Well, thank you again, Brittany. And you guys, all of her links and the YouTube series and uh, the aerial information will be in the links below if you want to connect with her. And uh, we just thank you so much for your time and your wisdom and keep your vision because it is having a ripple effect all around the world. Thank you. All right, guys. Hang in there. Thanks so much for hanging out with us today. I want to hear your aha moment from today's amazing episode. If you could leave a review at whatever podcast player you choose to listen from, Apple Podcast, CastBox, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you're listening from, leave a review and share with us your favorite part of today's episode. Thanks for hanging out. And remember to dream big.